Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining the Behind Company Lines podcast. Today we have Don Burton, founder and managing partner of LearnStart, a leading edge venture capital fund focused exclusively on education, learning, and talent. Don, I'm so excited to not only bring the audience your experience, your your expertise, your opinions, but really uncover this whole ecosystem around education technology. I think earlier on, maybe 2018, 2019, people were really kind of gaining traction got disrupted a little bit, but still individuals like yourself are leading kind of cutting edge ways to not only make technology and more implemented and more integral in terms of school systems, but also education platforms, but also really kind of leading innovative ways to restructure and kind of reframe. And I read a couple articles that, that you posted about it. So I'll definitely jump into those eventually. But before we get into LearnStart, what were you doing before you joined and, and, and built the, the company? Sure. So before I did LearnStart, I, I did kind of the quick career arc is I did professional service stuff. Like I worked at McKinsey and Goldman Sachs, and then I did yeah. my, I, I worked for the Walt Disney company. So did a little bit of corporate stuff. And then I was a serial entrepreneur and then luckily got a couple good singles and doubles. So exited a couple startups and was able to angel invest. After angel investing, Techstars approached me to run one of the startup accelerator programs focused on education, learning, and talent, as you mentioned, yeah. and that's where my startups were as well. And so from there, I kind of got into the investing side with Techstars and ran a startup accelerator for a couple of years, and then eventually got into seed capital and yeah. seed venture capital investing. And that's where Learn Start has evolved. So, uh, so that's the quick yeah. summary. Yeah, and it's so exciting thinking about. Well, even when we think about education and technology, I think a lot of individuals maybe think about hardware in schools or programs that teach tech, you know, technical skills. But what are you seeing in terms of the innovation that companies are bringing to the table, and what are the the creative ways that they're not only supporting and enabling students or or people wanting to learn? but also kind of changing the, the traditional model of learning. Sure. So actually, the most, most of the exciting, innovative new learning models are happening outside of school, right? Because school yeah, yeah. and the traditional educational institutions are usually the last to change. So a lot of innovations happening in the corporate training and learning, lifelong learning kind of area. B2C is big, going directly to the home. And then replacing traditional models. So instead of like selling the next curriculum, the academic subject uh, curriculum into schools, schools that are kind of reinventing education are kind of more micro schools. One of the biggest trends is instead of just having your traditional public school or your traditional private school, there's a lot of smaller micro schools popping up like Elon Musk. Everyone knows him, but they don't yeah. know that he started his own micro school for his kids originally. And then he opened that up to all of the SpaceX people in LA. Yeah. And now he's got Ad Astra in, in Austin as well. And he's offered it up to anybody can now come to his Ad Astra school. And, and, and it's basically just, it's a school that looks more, looks a lot more like the real world, right? Yeah. You're yeah. Engaged in things you care about. And you have all this scaffolding around getting really good at reading, write arithmetic. But in the context of doing something that you care about and that's meaningful to you. So a lot of project based yeah. work, a lot of work that looks more like the real world and then just getting educated while you're doing stuff in the real world. So right. and, and that's a lot of micro schools. We're invested in a company called Prenda, Galileo XP, Kidato. These are all micro schools in different parts of the world. And that's a big trend that's doing yeah. education in a very different way. And the early adopters are starting to go into to that stuff. Yeah. So, so that's kind of just a quick overview of just all the different segments from birth to past yeah. career, yeah. what's going on. And there's, I, I think it's different in each segment, yeah. but there are a lot of good innovation in each, yeah. each segment of the market. So it's, it, yeah. it's an interesting time for the education space. Yeah. And you always think about, obviously it's popular to, to discuss kind of the way the traditional model of education gets disrupted. And I, I want to think back in terms, in terms of what are the signals that that you're seeing in, in terms of what's causing the need for this disruption. What are some of the, is it measurables? Is it standardizations of tests becoming decreasingly low? Or is it outcomes that we're seeing not be positive or, or having negative effects or not reaching what our standards or expectations were? What are some of those signals that we're seeing for this innovation to really becoming more and more popularized and for, at the forefront? rather than just for the elite you know, individuals who have yeah. the means to, to create structured programs. Understood. So, so yeah, so some of the signals are certainly 
that you look at some of the data, yeah. the government has spent, I think since the seventies, it's the statistics are wild. And I have it in one of my blog posts that I can yeah. share with you directly, but the statistics are something like we've, we've tripled the amount of money in real terms, not inflation, mm -hmm. inflation adjusted dollars. We've tripled the amount of money we spend on education, yet the results have not improved at all. So mm -hmm. I, I can't think of a sector where you, of the economy anywhere, that if you spend three times as much, yeah. people are satisfied if you have zero improvement yeah. on outcomes or anything else. And I think that we've had this kind of industrial age model that really did serve the the kids ages yeah. ago to get these notational systems of reading, writing, arithmetic, you needed to kind of get, isolate yourself in these school systems and learn these very difficult notational systems. I think it's much, again, it's, you still need reading, writing, arithmetic, but in today's world, you need to think critically. You think you need to think creatively. You need to be a sure. practical problem solver. You need to communicate. You need to collaborate and have social intelligence. So there's, so there's yeah. so many skill sets that we need and focusing on just the core academic skills isn't enough. It's necessary, yeah. not sufficient anymore. And I think people really woke up during the, the COVID days when schools were locked down and everyone was forced to go do online learning. Parents could look over their kid's shoulder and see, geez, whatever these experiences are that we're offering yeah. in the classroom, they're not that good in the classroom. And then they're really bad when they're in Zoom school and you don't have yeah. personal connection in a classroom. So, so I think everyone expected amazing amounts of change to happen during COVID and post COVID. And there certainly was a one a ton of online learning happening during COVID, but it was kind of the quality of the learning was just kind of replicating what we do in traditional classrooms. And it wasn't very exciting. And we've had kind of a pullback since the, since COVID, right. Or yeah. since people been in the classrooms and, and the, the change pace has not continued at the same rate. And it, and it really should be. And I do believe that there's a, a, a larger debate going on about what kind of experiences are we providing our kids and what kind yeah. of outcomes are we looking for? And again, I just think the outcomes of the old industrial schooling model just aren't sufficient for yeah. today's innovation age and the changes we have today. So, so th that's kind of some of the drivers is just, and I think awakening awareness really happened during COVID of yeah. there, 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 it might be, there, there might be a better way, <laughs> right? Yeah. I think yeah. Some people do believe school's broken, but they really don't know what that better way is. And I think we're just inventing that now. And yeah. it's going to be an exciting period in this time because education has not been known as your advanced technology. We're really going <laughs> to deploy technology in innovative ways. It's been a laggard in the use of technology. And I do yeah. think that we're kind of reaching a tipping point where education is, is going to be using technology. They're going to be using technology in very different ways than just delivering a traditional yeah. schooling model education. So again, yeah. we're kind of at the very beginning of that, but I think it's going to be extremely lots of change, lots of innovation happening yeah. in the next five to 20 years. Yeah. And, and seems to obviously rely on a, a, a lot of innovative founders and, and the technologies they're bringing in terms of their local environment and how that affects, because it's such a big, I don't want to say problem, I guess even industry, right? Education is such a huge industry in and of itself that it does rely on the small innovators. But thinking about education as from a founder standpoint, wanting to break in, wanting to develop something that's going to help or benefit people, whatever my, I guess, problem set that I'm going after, it's not a traditional industry that I think is very lucrative. But in, 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 in terms of pricing models and building kind of a, a business model around it, it's difficult to say charge consumers because typically you're, you're giving people who don't have resources, resources. How do you kind of advise your founders to create kind of business models or ways to have a value driven system and also price it in a way that isn't so reliant on consumers, but maybe on partnerships or other things? I'd love to hear your response to that. Yeah, I think that uh, business models differ by the different segments. So if you look at the sure. at the corporate training markets, obviously business SaaS models are very popular, right? So businesses exactly. can afford to have an, a per employee rate and every employee that's using this education or training platform, they can pay a SaaS model type of subscription, which 
yeah. which is very been a proven business model for lots of different B2B startup founders. And I think it is a really good model that if you look at Udemy, most of their sales, they started yeah. as a B2C where they were selling to customers, but now, you know, the vast majority of their revenues comes from business with yeah. employees being able to access the platform and learn whatever they want to learn on the Udemy platform. Coursera yeah. has a very similar model. Pluralsight had the tech thing. So that's, that's very common and popular in the business side of things. And you can charge per course as well. But I think what, what the most successful business model in the corporate training market has been a subscription per head. And yeah. again, it kind of gets in there and it stays for a long time and has great retention. And, that, and that's a really good business model yeah. for, the, for the corporate environment. Higher ed, what you're seeing is more experimentation with how do we fund what a student's doing? So you, you've heard mm -hmm. of the ISAs and all that type of stuff where the students are, hey, you pay a little bit up front, but then you pay on the back end. Once you get a job, you get a new skill. It gets you a new job on a great career, digital okay. career path, and you'll, you'll pay back the education while you're getting paid. And it's a much more affordable way of paying for a graduate degree of going to NYU yeah. film school paying 80,000 a year. You go to a company like Creator Up, and you actually get jobs producing digital media for companies and all sorts of different needs. Yeah. And you learn why you're getting apprenticed and, and getting paid. And you get better and better and better and better jobs and higher and higher pay yeah. as you kind of start at the entry level and move up. So there's lots of interesting, and, the, and these could be higher, different, different alternative pathways to higher ed. Instead of getting a film degree, go to Creator Up and just start working in the, in the film and TV yeah. and digital media space. So there's lots of that type of experimentation happening in the higher ed and early career area. And then, and, and even, even some of the changes that are going on in, in universities, like we were invested in a company called Podium, which kind yeah. of outsources a whole new department. So like if your college doesn't have data science, you can go to Podium, you can white label their kind of data science program and you can get a minor or a major and you can just like have a, a degree in a box or a minor in a box. And they, they have an online thing. They have professionals teach it and you get really good at data science or some other type of technical skill. And so they, they actually roll those out to regular universities, but it's a very different program once you're in a regular university, but you do yeah. get credit for it in a university. And then if you go down to, that's higher ed, if you go to K-12, most of the interesting stuff is happening B2C. And mm -hmm. it could be like summer camp business, like the hottest topic in the country these days or around the globe is generative AI, right? We're, right. we're invested in a company called AI Camp, and they teach kids how to become prompt engineers and how to become yeah. AI experts from middle school on up. And, and yeah. it's more that summer camp model, like summer camp after school programs. Th that's a big, big industry, $30 billion plus type of industry with summer camps and, and after school programs. And those are B2C types of opportunities. And there's a lot of interesting B2C opportunities in the K-12 space, much more than you know, a major innovation in the traditional school, as I mentioned. Yeah. Uh, and so, and then, and then early childhood, there's stuff for parents. There's new ways, like everyone knows One Medical, which kind of the general practitioner office, One Medical had a really yeah. innovative model happen there. That's kind of being replicated for birth maternal care that we're invested in a company called Millie that does reinvents like one medical reinvented general practitioners. Millie mm -hmm. is doing that for maternal care. And once you're, you're pregnant, there's a much different way to get support while you're pregnant. There's a company we're invested in called Brave Care that does that for pediatrics. So, so you're seeing like that innovative one medical model happen in these kind of more, yeah. we, we think it's human flourishing. And, and, and so we want innovation and transformation and all these different segments of human flourishing. So those are, education, learning, and talent, because it's really important how you get your, your start in the world. And so yeah. we, we both invest in Millie and Brave Care. And then we have parenting st stuff like Baby Sparks that could get you a lot of support in your home. And again, these are more subscription-based models, right? So mm -hmm. your insurance pays for maternal care and, and pediatric care, but things like Baby Sparks, which is parenting support, information and classes and courses and all this stuff, that's a subscription model. Yeah. So you can sign up for this level of subscription or this level of subscription. And again, 
pretty good retention, especially in the early years right. when parents don't have a lot of support and they haven't kind of outsourced their, their yeah. education to different institutions, they will utilize these kind of B2C education offerings. And so across right. the spectrum, you're seeing different business models for different segments. And there are a lot of good models. One of the bad yeah. models is knocking on doors at K-12 district offices sure. and trying to sell your stuff into districts. That's a really frustrating, fragmented yeah. Byzantine system of trying to get your product out there. And yes, that, that's the kind of when people think of ed tech, they think of that yeah. type of sales thing and, and it's not. But hey, we've got business SaaS, we've got consumer subscription, like Netflix yeah. subscription models. So we've got a lot of really interesting models. It's just not in the traditional systems. Yeah. And thinking about, I, I read one of your articles and it was talking about the, the reinvention of the future of education and thinking about how, how these all impact the structure in which we learn. I would love for you to just illuminate the audience on kind of the, the, the thesis behind that in, 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 in a way that really kind of reinvents the structure of not only not the information we ingest, but also how we go about learning that and our relationship to it and then the mechanics behind it and how that kind of creates a whole different ecosystem versus the more traditional lecture model or even even small group kind of collaboration. It's a little bit outdated or, or it's still useful, but yeah. we need to add on top of that. Yeah. We'd love to hear. Yeah, so so you think about first principle innovation, yeah. right? And so so if you think about the schooling model, if we had to invent the best way to get people competent at the world at different skills and different areas of the world, different domains, different fields, you probably would not invent the, the modern, what we have as the schooling system, like where you send people off, you lecture them, you, they have to take good notes and then study their notes and then and you yeah. do a multiple choice test where they give the answer back of multiple choice stuff. It, it, that's really not how to get competent in the real world. The, the best, right. if you're really good at schooling, that predicts that you're going to be really good at schooling. But schooling is just one small activity, right? It's fairly narrow activity. If you think about it, what students are asked to do well, it's like memorize yeah. information and then regurgitate that information on a multiple choice test or something. Yeah. That's not really paid for in the real world. And to get competent at all the different STEM fields or all the different creative areas or all the different business functions and, and stuff like that, you need a totally different set of competences. And and so, so I think what we're starting to understand and starting to, uh, to do is good to go back to the first principles about how do people learn? People learn by having really rich experiences. Like, like I come into a situation, it's rich situation. It has a real context and I have expectations about what's going to happen and I'm going to do X, Y, Z, P, D, Q. And then all of a sudden I get in that context and boom, things don't happen like I expect. And it's like, <laughs> whoa, why did that happen? Right. And, and you have to learn, you have to like, oh, I was surprised. And now with that yeah. kind of surprise, it's like, well, why did that happen? What did I think that was not accurate? And then how can I adjust my thinking? And how can I get from point A to point B as effectively as possible? And I have to learn and get over barriers in order to make change happen. And that's where you really learn. So if you think about human learning, we, we, we're, we're amazing learners. We learn 24 seven, we're always yeah. learning. The, the matter is, what kind of quality experiences are we having that get us up a competence curve? Mm. And so I think what's what's happening, and I'm not certain which article you're thinking about, because I have a number of blog posts sure. on medium.com. It's DC Burton at medium.com or when you go to medium.com. You know, what we what 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 I describe there is that we're really starting to just go back to these first principles and rethink how do we support and scaffold people getting yeah. competent in the real world. And again, the schooling model isn't really a, gr a great model. It's kind of a blip if you think about it. Like you know, humans have been around for more than 200,000 years. We've always learned within the context of the real world like for hundreds of thousands of years. And then during the industrial age, we did have to learn these complex notational systems, but we kind of threw out the baby and the bathwater because if you could be a great blacksmith, but you couldn't read, write arithmetic. We didn't want that. But now we, you can be, do great radio write arithmetic, but you kind of are abstracted from the real world and you're not competent at solving real world problems and real world issues yeah. with real world skill sets. And so I think what we're going to see moving forward is this combination of kind of like pre-industrial age schooling model. You had apprenticeships were very popular. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a yeah. combination of apprenticeships with more of an explicit intervention that's a real 
explicit educational intervention with goals about how to get you more competent, but it's not going to be isolated and abstracted in a, like a school classroom that's not related to the real world. You're going to bring the school into the real world and have educational interventions that make that experience much richer for you so you get more competent more quickly. And I use examples in that, in that blog series, like I, I was a business analyst at McKinsey and Company right when I got done with undergraduate education. And I, I performed well in undergraduate education. I thought I'd just jump in. And of course, I'm a smart guy from a good school. I'm going to do great. It's like, holy moly, the thinking that required the business analyst program at McKinsey goes, is totally different. And they did an amazing job of scaffolding you because you get thrown into a community of experts who are really good at business problem solving. And they kind of scaffold you all the way up yeah. the curve because you're working with people that have been doing it for years. They correct you. They give you feedback. They intervene in the end product that you're producing and they tell you what's good, what's not, and why. And then you, you, you just learn on steroids when you're in this yeah. kind of like expert community of practice. And, and I think bringing the school to the real world context is a big wave of stuff we're going to see because in order to get competent at stuff that the world needs, you need to like go into the world, find a really good high performing community of practice, and then work with them. And as sure. you work with them, you get really good and really competent at stuff. So that, yeah. that's kind of like a fundamentally, we're going to go back to first principles about how do people get competent at real world skills. And that's how you do it. And so we're going to, yeah. I think we're at the very early stages of a major shift to a different form of education, just like the shift when we were an apprentice and didn't have, didn't know the notational systems and, and, and the industrial age schooling model was invented. Now we need an invented model for the innovation age. And what we have now does not produce the output that we need for the innovation age. Yeah. So we're going to have to reinvent it and we have to go back to first principles to reinvent what does good quality education, learning, and competence development look like. And, and we're yeah. at the beginning of reinventing that. Yeah, it's, it's so exciting because it's like, like you were saying, the scaffolding is, is being constructed, but the need is there. People are using different, even social channels that were for connecting and communicating now for learning and, and development like TikTok and, so, and Instagram and all these different different channels in, in new and in creative ways to learn and people are craving it. And it, it, it's really, I think, imperative that we create not only some structure around, around it, but some fidelity and validity around the, the practices and, and what's, what's true. And, and if it's not 100% true, how do we un uncover it and build some curiosity in that as well? Yeah. And, we, and, and again, and one thing that's really important, like we've had progressive schools, so to speak, like, oh, we're going to do project-based learning and stuff. But, you, but, but it's really important, as you just mentioned, there needs to be rigor and accountability, right? There's a performance yeah. criteria. And if you just go off and do your own little architecture project on your own with three kids in a school project, but you never get the kind of rigor that what does good architecture look like, right? What kind of skill sets do you need? What, what is the developmentally appropriate spiral where you start with this kind of entry level project and you move up to really highly, highly competent expert type of projects? And there is a pathway with there's serious performance, serious criteria about what does good architecture look like. Yet, if you just do that project-based learning, you're not going to learn much, right? You've, yeah. got, you've got to really find an expert community of practice to plug into that knows what those performances are. So at McKinsey and Company, it wasn't like, oh, progressive education. I can just do what I'm interested in and I'm interested in this project. And isn't that great? I'm going to go have some ideas there. No, a client has a real problem that needs a real solution yeah. and it's going to work or not work. And there's real performance criteria that everybody lets you know about. There's rigor yeah. and accountability. And we really yeah. need that. And we need that kind of plugging in to real world community of practice. And that's what we've yeah. been missing, even with the best progressive education out there. Yeah. And shipping gears here, thinking about LearnStart and, and the companies you've been working with, the bets you've made. Tell us a little bit about the traction. What was exciting about the current companies you're, you're working with and invested in, but what's particularly exciting about the next phase of LearnStart and, and what you're going to be working on? Sure. So we, we've invested in a lot of companies across all those different segments. So we're kind of agnostic. We'll, we'll look at any segment of the education market from birth yeah. to senior citizen type of opportunities, et cetera. Yeah. So we look at everything and we look at all the different product types within those. And, and so basically, again, as I mentioned, I'm most excited about the kind of innovation that's been going on in the corporate world 
just because yeah. it immediately trans results immediately translates into better performance for a company and they can tell the difference and they're willing to pay for a really high quality product that makes a difference for their employees, right? So, so back in 2013, when I was running one of the Techstars Accelerator programs, we invested in Degreed and Degreed is what's called a, a learning experience platform. And it's a new, mm -hmm. new terminology. We used to have learning yeah, management yeah. systems, right? And learning management systems was just, hey, go over to this warehouse and find the course about compliance type of stuff. Yeah. Like you need to know about diversity. You need to know about alcohol abuse. You need to know about yeah. this, that, and the other thing. And you had to go watch these different videos or different curriculum that you kind of had to check the yeah. box. And that's what learning management systems were all about because people needed to go through these courses or the company needed to check you off that you did this. And, and, and that was a silo. And what the greed came along in the, in the 2010s and they basically said, geez, there's real skills that your business units need. Like, so if you're AT&T, they were going through a huge transition from the old telcos to a mobile trying to be an innovative company. And they yeah. had some really amazing kind of ways of aligning the skills the company needed with what the yeah. employee wanted. So if you're an employee, it's like, wow, I'd really love to learn coding or I, co coding bo bores me to death. I want to learn kind of digital marketing and go-to-market strategies and all this kind of cool stuff, or I want to learn creative stuff. So the employees would say, I want to learn these skill sets and AT&T or other corporates would decide, hey, here are the skill sets that are really important for us to be successful in our sector. And then we'll match you up. Like, you want to do yeah. this, you want to do, we'll, we'll put you on a learning pathway that gets you yeah. competent and we'll pay for it. So instead of like, you used to have corporate programs where it's just like, oh yeah, go back to college and we'll pay for half of it or something like that. But no, they, this was degree to help companies align the skills they needed to be successful in the marketplace with your already existing employee base and what they wanted to get better at. They could raise their hand and tell you what they wanted to get more competent at, and then you could help them up that learning curve and that competence curve. And so Degreed was one of the yeah. first guys out there and invented this thing called the learning experience platform. And they've been doing really well. They were, they're one of my first unicorns. Like I invested in them back a long, long time ago. And they're one of the first unicorns in the existing portfolio. One of the companies that's performing fantastically is that Pro Podium company that I talked yeah. to, uh, to you about that, that sells kind of a major or minor in a box and sells it to a university to white label, right? Creates a, a yeah. data science department at any university overnight, right? And so, yeah. so it's doing really well because it's practical, professional driven. You're developing a real set of competences around data science that's very employable. So, so the yeah. people in that university can get that degree or that minor and then go get a job because people want that data science skills. And so, so, yeah. so they're doing really well and they've got a really interesting business model. And so, so again, I think there's a lot of different ways in these different segments, whether, whether it's corporate, whether it's higher ed and alternatives to higher ed, or even these micro schools like Prenda and Elon Musk at Astra, that's kind of a whole new way of doing education. And it starts to play with some of those first principles that I've kind yeah. of outlined in my blog post series. So, so there's a lot of really interesting stuff and we've invested in a, a ton of different um, opportunities and have had really good success, like degree and podium and AI camp and yeah. all these different Prenda has been very successful as a micro school in Arizona, the money in K-12 can follow the student much more easily than in other States. So if you're yeah. a parent and you said, oh, I want to sign up for a micro school, like Elon Musk micro school or Prenda micro school, you get the money that the state would have spent at the school you get mm -hmm. it to go to whatever school you want, as long as it's an approved school. And so Prenda offers something up. Parents don't have to pay a thing. They take the money from the state and then they get to go to a micro school for, instead of going to the, the traditional stuff. Yeah. And yeah. those types of models, those types of models are happening and they're very interesting. The other big thing that's happening in the States is this thing called education savings accounts. So it's like the money following you. It's not fully like Arizona has a much bigger price tag that follows the kid, but these education savings accounts, if you want to go find innovative education alternatives, they're out there and the state is starting to fund you if you're in the K-12 space. And then you could sign up for a micro school. It's not like homeschooling, which is a huge responsibility yeah. for the parent, but there's better tools for homeschooling. But even more importantly, you can place your kid in a school and they will 
find the right opportunities and the right experiences for your kid. And they can do that digitally with local pods. So you get socialization with other kids in your local area, but the curriculum is more driven by a national online provider. Yeah. So, so again, a lots of really interesting stuff and we've had success in almost every set, you know, there's some way to skin the cat in every set. Yeah. <laughs> And what would you say are some of the main drivers behind that success? Is it the, the op, how, how the founders are operating? Is it some kind of the, the way you approach, how you go to market? What, what kind of continues this success and this consistency behind in, in these different segments that have different models, have different challenges? What, yeah. would, you, what would you say would, would be a, a, one of those pieces? Yeah, I think three, three things from a business building point of view. One is your customer value proposition. Like how much sure. better is your customer value proposition than what's, what's available out there, right? So entrepreneurs have done really good at like degreed, invented something that wasn't really happening very much, right? <laughs> so it was a really wonderful customer value proposition. Then the go-to-market strategy, as you mentioned, th that's important too. So you got to have a, a great product that's highly differentiated and yeah. compelling to the user. And then you have, a, have to have a great go-to-market strategy because just trying to get consumers through Facebook or Google ads, that's really expensive. And so you really have to figure out innovative ways to go to market and get to your customer. And, and that's almost as equally as important as getting a great product is getting yeah. great distribution and being able to get it in the hands of the consumers that want it, right? And then lastly, we always look at when we're looking at companies, how good are they at the business unit economics, right? So what's the business yeah. model? How are they making money? What, what's the process by which they, you know, how much are they spending? How much are they renting? Yeah, what's the right. cost base? What's the revenue? And what's the unit economics look like? And the best entrepreneurs and the best startups are really good at all three of those things. And we're looking for all of those. I would say we start with the customer value proposition just because if you don't have that, the other two don't matter. <laughs> so you really yeah, have to yeah. tell me customer value proposition is the, is the way to go. And that's yeah. where we start with is how big of a problem space is this? How, how good are the people and the founders at, at being able to, to take advantage of this opportunity? So, so you yeah. know, those are just a, a few of the things that we look at when we're trying to decide on which startups do we want to place a bet on. Yeah. Yeah. I like this next section. I call it my founder FAQs. So I, I, I'll hit you with the rapid fire questions and now uh, we'll see where we go. So first question I always like to open up with is what's particularly hard about your job day to day? One thing that's really hard is just making that assessment because there's an infinite amount of entrepreneurs and you'd love to support all of them because all of them have passion. They have heart. They want to make a change in the world and they feel like really passionate about that change they want to make in the world. Yeah. And so you'd like to fund everybody, <laughs> yeah. but you can't do that. And we've got, we've got a return to our, in order to attract the capital, we have to provide great returns to our investors. And so yeah. you really have to be discerning and you have to let people down because you're not investing in their company. So the hardest thing is to yeah. say no, especially when you really like the entrepreneur, you really are rooting for them and you want them to go fight the good fight. but you're not, it's not gonna, the proof or the evidence isn't there yet. Or you're not a hundred percent certain. So you can't make the investment. And we, we, we make one in, for every investment that we hear, we probably may make one out of 200 in, you know, companies that pitched. Yeah. We only bet in and put an investment in one out of 200. So it's, a, that's the, probably the most challenging and disappointing yeah. just because you would love to support everybody, but you can't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And thinking about the founders that you do support when they have the, those foundational pieces kind of in place, they yep. have kind of strong market fit, they, they yep. have, have a strong go to market strategy, they, they've done all the thing operationally to be strong foundationally, understand their, the unit economics to really go and attack markets. What would you say, I think about managing people as a huge headache in terms of variables that you are kind of are outside of your control and thinking about founders and their experience, there's managing people, there's client relationships. What do you see a lot of founders kind of consistently needing to kind of, I guess, adopt to or adapt to being, it's, it's non-traditional. You typically have an evangelist or someone who comes from an industry. They may not have brought or built out a team. So that type of skill set is, is a huge learning curve for a lot of founders. What would you say kind of keeps them up at night when thinking about building and motivating teams? Yeah. So interestingly, I do feel like entrepreneurship is, is a really tough and lonely game because usually if it's you and one co-founder, 
like you guys have the weight of the world to really make this opportunity happen and stuff. So, mm -hmm. so you kind of feel that pressure and you feel that like the burn rate and what you've got in the bank and what you're burning per month, that kind of runway yeah. ke ke keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller with each month that passes. So you feel the intensity and the pressure to really get it to work, get the customers to love it, get the customers to start spending money. And so that pressure is really important. And there's not a big team, right? Like you, it's, it's the two founders, and then you've got people that you're hiring that might not have the same kind of pressure that you do because you're putting in right. money, raising money from people. But I think managing that type of stress, you know, you got to kind of be built for it and you got to know what you're getting into because yeah. sometimes entrepreneurship sounds very sexy, but you really do have to love the problem that you're trying to solve. And you really have to like be manic and obsessive uh -huh. about, yeah. about kind of wanting to really solve this problem. And if it's just like, oh, I'm just doing this for fun and to make money, it's going to be a really tough haul because there's just yeah. so many pivots and iterations that you have to make to really keep moving your company in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And so I think for, from a founder's point of view, you know, that's really challenging and you really got to love and be passionate about what you're doing for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And being that like a lot of founders have to work with say remote teams, for instance, how are they able to communicate that? Is, is it through kind of cultural, culture establishing kind of meetings or, or sessions? Is yeah. it reinforcing yeah. them through different practices? How do they do that? How do they communicate to keep everybody in focus? Yeah, no, I think Scott Galloway just wrote a, a blog post about storytelling. And yeah. you think about the entrepreneur, he really has to be a master storyteller, right? Because you're, yeah. you're trying to get all your employees aligned on a vision and you have to make that a vision sound exciting and get people's energy up around it. You have to get investors excited about it. You got to get your yeah. customers excited about it. So one of the key skill sets for any entrepreneur is storytelling. And that's for, and if you're doing it online, it's even more difficult than in when you're in person, right? So you got to be right. a great storyteller. You got to bring your energy, bring your passion and be articulate about where we're yeah. going so that people understand it. And they're like, yeah, I'm with yeah. you. Let's go. Right. And yeah. so that, that yeah. to me is like the, the key skill set is storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. What's something that you, you've seen, even maybe in your experience as well, something that founders are not necessarily good at in the onset of their entrepreneurial journey that you, you, they could be better at kind of joining on or focus on or develop skills now, even if they're in the midst of building the startup that could help kind of impact their overall business outcomes and, and themselves as a leader. Anything coming yeah. up? Yeah, no, I, I just read recently some article that said, or some quote that said, first time founders focus on the, the, the customer, the cu customer value proposition. What's the product? And the product needs to be great. Yeah. And second time founders focus on go to market strategy, right? <laughs> because yeah. in other words, it's kind of like the first time you just like, you're so obsessed with a product, you can have a great product. And yes, a great product does help you sell through and helps word yeah. of mouth, but you really have to be, have the same sort of a passion and experimentation around your go to market strategy. And what are the channels that are going to give you the lowest ca cost per acquisition, cost acquisition of a yep. customer? You got to get that really low and you got to be really creative about how do I find my customers? How do I go to market? What channels can I use? What direct sales? What, yeah. What's the best way and the cheapest yeah. way to get my product out to the globe? And that's really challenging when Facebook and Google are charging you a ton of money for yeah. eyeballs on any given search result or anything else. So, sure. so I do think that, again, just people... And when you're a first time founder, you're more focused on the product. When you're a second time founder, you kind of expand your horizon more and you really yeah. understand how important go to market is or business unit economics, as we've talked yeah. about. So, so that, that, yeah. that, again, that's kind of a general trend. And then every individual is a little bit different, right? Like your strength and weakness profile is different than mine, different than Fred's. Everyone sure. has what kind of mistakes I'm going to make depends on what my profile of strengths and weaknesses is. And so I find that individually, it's different for everybody, right? So, yeah. so it's, what you need to grow and, and learn about is different and, and you come into it yeah. depending on who you are. Yeah. Yeah. I love to ask this next question because I love how my guests kind of extract knowledge out of anything that they ingest. So it's whether it's books or people who has impacted you the most, things that you kind of still use to this day, anything in terms of books or people come to mind. Yeah. Well, it's interesting in education, I mentioned first principles. 
So, yeah. so in other words, if you go back, like you, you look at thought about what is a human being and how do you become fully realized? Yeah. You could go all the way back to the Greeks and the foundation of Western civilization, which are the kind of first principles like Plato. You know, yeah. Like if you think about Pythagoras and Plato, they had philosophy academies. It's because philosophy wasn't something you just study so you can get good answers on a multiple choice test. Yeah. Philosophy was, how do I live my life as effectively as possible? How do I just, mm -hmm. I'm here for whatever short period of time I'm here. How do I live the best life possible? They would live together in a community that thought about that and practice that. Like, okay, we're going to do this differently. Like the Stoics and the, Pla the Plato's Academy and Pythagoras' Academy, they were all like, I'm going to live this and I'm going to go ap make applications of all the th philosophy that I have. I'm going to go live it every day, every minute of my life, right? And so I think you go back to first principles. I really love all of really understanding how all these great thinkers thought throughout the ages. And then what can, there's now cognitive science kind of takes all of that and tries to, there's a guy named John Verveke who does a YouTube series called like something like waking up from the meaning crisis. And we, we really, yeah. how do we humans, we need meaning in our world and we need that kind of passion to live a great life. And then cognitive sciences are really kind of understanding that in a much more profound way. There's different types of knowing. It's not, just not conceptual propositional knowing. It's participatory knowing, it's purpose, perpexed, a perspective knowing, and it's like procedural knowing. There's all these different knowings that we use our whole person, not just our heads. And, and yeah. cognitive science is really taking that on now. And so I think there's a lot of great cognitive science books out there from the neuroscience, like Antonio Damasio, who wrote Descartes' Error and On Knowing is his latest book. He, he talks about the neuroscience of all of this. And yeah. you can go all the way from neuroscience to psychology and anthropology. And it's just really good. There's just a ton of great stuff out there. Yeah. Yeah. Don, it's been such a pleasure chatting with you. Last little bit is, did we leave anything on the table? Is there any question I didn't ask you that I should have? Or anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to bring up? Anything we left on the table here today? Yeah, I will just summarize that real school is the future of education is kind of my motto. And that we're really... When I say real school, instead of this artificial environment, like a classroom, you really need to bring the learning into the place that you're doing the activity and where you're trying to perform something in the real world. I'm trying to get yeah. to be a better kiteboarder. Well, I need to go get in feedback while I'm kiteboarding, right? Or, <laughs> or anything, whether I'm trying to do digital media production or whatever it is, you really need to have the school embedded in you performing within that context. And so I, so I call that real school instead of like old school. And yeah. that's, I think, going to be the future of education. And, and again, we have to invent it from first principles. And we're just at the very beginning processes of doing that. But there's going to be a lot of exciting stuff out there. There already is a lot of exciting stuff out there. And, there, and parents can take advantage of all this stuff. They don't have to wait 20 years. Yeah. They can go do real school learning with their kids. And, and all of us can go do that right now. And generative AI is just making it easier. So uh, you're going to have your own independent tutor just help you get competent at whatever you want to get competent at. You just grab your generative AI and you're off and running, right? So yeah, uh, so yeah there's a lot of exciting stuff coming down the pike. So uh, stay tuned. Yeah. Don, it's been such a pleasure learning about you as an early entrepreneur, but how you impact current entrepreneurs with Learn Start and, and Waves. Not only you think about building companies, but building companies in the education sets that are really, really thinking about these outcomes and these, these value-driven outcomes that really not only impact businesses positively, but are incentivized similarly with their customers and really kind of push the envelope. So last little bit, Don, is where can we find you? Give us your LinkedIn, give us your Twitters, where can we connect and be a fan, but also support Lean Start and what you're working on? Yeah. So at Don Burton on LinkedIn, and then my blog post series that we've mentioned a couple of times is at Medium. So it's a Medium backslash DC Burton. So that's amazing. Probably the best places. Cool. Don, thank you so much for being on the show. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Absolutely. My pleasure. Great to talk to you. Have a great evening. <laughs>